I'll now call to order the special board of education meeting um, and workshop for the Chico Unified School District for October 4th, 2023. It is now 5 p.m. Uh, could we please stand for the flag salute? Alrighty, uh, if there are any board members that have announcements, now is the time to provide those. I guess it won't hurt to announce <coughs> the Ammon Bowl date again, which is next weekend, right? The 13th, is that Friday the 13th? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, it's at PB's Asgard Yard Stadium. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements? Seeing none, we'll move to item three, consent calendar. Um, are there any public comments on consent calendar? Oh, yes, there are, actually. Um, so we can take public comments from um, the consent calendar. Uh, we have Sean Mossman signed up. Okay, do you know um, which item? Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so seeing no additional um, public comments for consent calendar, are there any um, board members that would like to pull an item from consent? Okay, um, then in that case, do we have a motion? I'll move the consent calendar. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Tennis and a second by Ms. Robinson. Um, I will say uh, it wasn't um, a point to need to pull an item or anything like that, but um, the only thing that I, I had a question for district staff on with the consent calendar was that there are the, um, the site plans for, um, uh, for safety, school site safety. Um, very good comprehensive plans um, and I just had a couple questions about um, sort of broader um, evacuation type um, and like wildfire readiness um, I feel like the this community doesn't necessarily put enough stock in wildfire readiness and so I just had some questions from the district on that and um, uh, there there may be a little additional information coming um, about that later on so uh, thank you um, okay, so we will take a vote. Um, it's our first vote of the night, so we'll do roll call vote. Um, we'll start with Mr. Lando. Lando, aye. Tennis, aye. Dalby, aye. Robinson, aye. Konkin, aye. All right, um, it passes 5-0, and we will move on to item number four, our board workshop. Uh, this is informational. The topic is physical education, dress code, and locker room privacy. Thank you, uh, President Dalby. I'll be bringing uh, Mr. Pedro Caldero to do the presentation along with some teachers that we have um, for tonight's presentation. Again, uh, as you guys know, um, Mr. Caldero is now our new director of secondary, and this is his first workshop presentation. So here we Take it easy on me, just so you guys know. Like you said, this is my first one. Maybe not the first time up here in front of the school board, but definitely my first presentation. So um, as we go through these slides and I give you guys some information with regards to PE and grades and dressing down and safety, uh, please know that um, I'm hoping that you all allow me to go through all the slides and then ask questions afterwards. At which point I will have uh, two teachers also join me, Carrie McGar from Marsh and Mr. Lawrence Taylor from Chico High School, as well as our secondary school site principals, the junior high and the high schools. I'd like to go over the um, state and federal mandates 
So the very first thing is all students in grades 7 to 12 must receive a minimum of 400 minutes of physical education instruction every 10 school days, and that's per education school code. Local school boards may exempt students from any two years of physical education in grades 10, 11, or 12. Since July of 2007, students must pass the physical performance test administered in grade 9 to receive the two-year exemption, and that's also per education code. If exempted, students must be provided a variety of physical education elective courses. There are some federal mandates with this. Uh, high school physical education courses uh, content must include instruction in each of the content areas, so you will see the effect of physical activity upon dynamic, dynamic health, mechanics of body movement, individual slash dual sports, gymnastics, tumbling, team sports, rhythm dance, and then one of my favorite combative sports like wrestling. Dress code policies. So for middle schools, all students, and this is true for high schools as well, and as I will share, all students are required to dress down for PE. Students can purchase PE clothing from the student store or bring their own from home or use CUSD provided PE clothes. For high schools, all students are also required to dress down for PE. Students can purchase PE clothing from the student stores, bring their own from home, or use CUSD provided PE clothes. The, our LEA requirements are as follows. Each local education agency needs to establish a PE dress policy for its district. It is appropriate for students to change their clothes for hygiene, safety, and movement efficiency and for efficiency purposes. Keep that in mind because that's going to come up later on. CUSD requirements AR5132, the principal or designee may impose dress requirements to accommodate the needs of special school activities, physical education classes, athletic activities, and other extracurricular or co-curricular activities. And student, here's, here's one for our students because I know as a, uh, the principal at Chico Junior, we always had students say, why can't we wear hats? Well, guess what? You can. Students shall be allowed to wear sun protective clothing, including, but not limited to, hats for outdoor use during the school day, as per education code. What does dressing down mean? So when students come in, what is really required of them? For both junior highs and high schools, is as follows. Changing into athletic clothes and shoes that allow the student to move freely and to participate in the activity. This can be school PE, this can be a school PE uniform or athletic clothing similar to school colors. And or it could also be just changing out of your clothing, your school clothing and changing into a t-shirt and or shorts and or sweatpants. PE grading policies for dressing down. Also keep this in mind because later on I'm going to show you guys some grades and then we're going to start going, oh my gosh, why, why is that? That doesn't make sense. So middle school, three out of ten participation points for suit cuts. That means not dressing down. Uh, Bidwell Jr. has minus five out of ten for not dressing down. Loaner clothes are provided to all students wanting to change or needing to change if that is what it is. Loaner clothes are the following. Clothes that are provided to our students are their school PE uniform and if a student doesn't have uh, a, the PE uniform or clothes, one is provided to them to change. Sorry Pedro, I have to break your rule of not interrupting you. Okay, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's been every slide so far but I've been taking notes instead. Um, just for clarification, because the bullet I don't think is clear enough to anybody who maybe hasn't had this discussion already where it says three out of 10 daily participation points for suit cuts, that, that means that three points out of 10 are taken away. That is correct. Not that they are getting three points That is the correct. Day. Okay, thank you. All right. High schools, same thing. Uh, they lose three out of 10 points for not dressing down. Uh, those are participation points for suit cuts. At Chico High, right now it's four out of 10. They will lose four out of 10 points for not dressing down. At Alt Ed, guess what? They don't have to deal with it. They don't have locker rooms at the alt ed, and so they do not lose points for dressing down. 
Parents are informed of all options at back to school night via the course uh, expectation sheet. And then here's the big one, is can a student fail PE for not wearing standardized uh, apparel? Under education, uh, sorry, education code 49066, section C states the following, no grade of a, of a pupil participating in a physical education class, however, may be adversely affected due to the fact that the pupil does not wear standardized physical education apparel, where the failure to wear such apparel arises from circumstances beyond the control of the pupil. So that means that if a student for some reason cannot dress down, that's based out of his control, that student cannot fail PE. So why do we dress down? One, it creates a mindset that you are ready to exercise. Two, athletic shoes for safety, right? You can't play basketball in sandals. Well, I, I mean, technically you could, but if it falls off, you can fall and hurt yourself. Physical movement hindered by certain clothes. Of course, if you're wrestling in jeans, that could be very difficult. Or if you're doing any sort of acrobatics, that could also be very difficult. Uh, although I can say that the new jeans that they make today are extremely elastic. Uh, hygiene, that's also important. All students have the same uniform, and by that meaning all students look this, have the uniform and, and it creates a team feeling and setting. By staying in their school clothes, students are less productive because they become concerned with ruining their school clothes. And that is a concern that comes down. PE grades. I don't know, hopefully this visual is good for you guys. Or do you guys have it on your Chromebooks as well? Okay, excellent. Just know that this reflects the LCAP. And uh, so we have the following, we have all students, and it goes by C or higher. So at the, if you look at the top, 92.5% of our students, and this is all secondary school sites, minus Fairview, so uh, that's an important thing to know. Uh, so grades six through 12. So 92.5% of our students have a grade C or higher. We're gonna go into deeper detail here with this in a second. 4.2% uh, of the population of all our students have a D. And then 3.2% have an F. Foster youth, you can see that right there. That's pretty high, uh, where you see the amount of students that are passing, they're at 79.2% that are passing that have a C or higher. 8.3 have a D, and of course, 12.5% of them have an F. As you go through, you'll see homeless, socioeconomic uh, disadvantage, student with disabilities, African American, American Indian, slash uh, Alaska Native, Asian, Filipino, Hispanic, and I'm gonna use the term Latino, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, white, and then two or more races. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to look at that because I'm sure you'll have questions for us in a bit. When does your a bit start? You said we'd have questions in a bit? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You'll have questions here. We're, we're almost halfway through. Oh, so we'll wait. Yes, if you could, thank you. All right. Okay, I am gonna go to the next slide now. Here's the grade distribution. At the top, you will see Bidwell Junior High School. The A's category, you have 826 students or 85.3% of that population that got A's. If you recall from the previous slide, they also had a uh, 
point, sorry, they could lose five points for not dressing down. They had the highest loss of points for not dressing down, yet they have the highest A total. And if you scoot on over to the F category, you see the lowest amount of Fs, which is, I'll be honest, I didn't expect that. I was a Chico Jr. last year. I was like, what? What's he doing over there? So then you have Chico Jr., which is next. And we have, a, you know, Chico Jr. has a, uh, you lose three points for not dressing down. 51.1% uh, of our student population received an A. If you look over to the F side, 31 received Fs. March Jr., 533, or 71.3% of the population, received A's. If you look far over to the right, 5% received Fs. Or sorry, five of them received Fs. PV, 437 students received A's. 16 received Fs, which is 2.2% 2. 2 of the population, right? Chico High School, 334 received A's. And you look to your right, 72, or 10% of the population received Fs. In total, 2,589 students, or roughly 63.2% of our student population, received A's. And 128 students, or roughly 3.3% of the population, received Fs. I want to go over locker room procedures because it's important to understand what this looks like. The bell rings. It's the beginning, first period. Students run to the locker room or walk to the locker room. Students go into the locker rooms to change. They are given five minutes to do the following. They have to open up their lockers. They change into their PE clothes. They lock those lockers or before they put their stuff in their locker, then lock them. They then, then they confirm they are all meeting for roll call. They, usually that is posted in the front of the locker room. And then they line up for roll call. At the end of the period, students go to, into the locker rooms and change. They're also given five minutes. They open up their lockers, they change into their school clothes, and then they go to the waiting area for the bell to ring. All schools, all, sorry, all middle schools and high schools have a designated wearing it, waiting area because what we don't want is students disrupting other classes when they change out early. We have safety concerns from our teachers. These are the items that make things difficult. The first one, supervision issues arise when some students dress and some students do not. So it creates, what that means is the following. Say you have three students in a class that are not dressing down. Those students go straight to the activity site. That could be inside the gym or on the blacktop. Those students may remain unsupervised while the teacher is inside supervising those that are changing. Now what happens is as teachers, as they decide or as the uh, students are changing, you have more students going out towards the blacktop, right? When you have the vast majority of them going out towards the blacktop, then you have your teacher following them. There might be some students left behind. That is something that also happens, and I think it's important to note. In a second, or the, actually the next one, I'll discuss why that is, why that happens. Supervision also has an issue when we have teachers who are on prep. Let me explain. Say you have um, a teacher that teaches uh, five periods out of six periods, and their prep period is first period, and they're in the boys' locker room, but that male PE teacher is out. So that PE class is very difficult or very difficult to supervise. So what administrators do is try to find somebody, usually a campus supervisor, to be present while the students change and or try to find coverage another way. And that happens in both the boys' and the girls' locker room. Another issue that becomes very difficult, and I think that's a very perfect slide, is, and there's gonna be some additional pictures to provide supervision within the locker room, is the actual configuration 
of those locker rooms. I equate it to the following. You guys go shopping in Safeway or Walmart or you name it, any type of superstore, and there are huge aisles. You can never see the other people on the other aisles. It's impossible. It's very difficult. You can even go to the end, and you cannot see behind them. The way the locker rooms are built, supervision becomes very difficult. But you also got to recall, when they, were addition, when they were initially built, they were also built for privacy so that students couldn't see on the other side. So it's a very interesting dilemma. They created privacy by creating these walls, if you will, and not being able to see beyond them, but it also created supervision issues. The other problem is out-of-date locks. So what I mean by that is the following. Do you guys remember when I said you have some students left behind in the locker room, and then the teacher's following the other students out to the blacktop or to the gym? What happens is, is you have students because of the outdated locks, having difficulty trying to open them. They may forget the combo locks, or even worse, this does happen, you have students because they are the, I guess, removable locks, meaning that they're not attached, and I will show you here in the next slide. The student will take off that lock, find it funny, go put it on another lock. And so when you have a student trying to unlock their own lock, they can't do it. So now you have your teacher trying to figure out whose lock it is to help them open it so that they can be out on the blacktop on time for roll call while the students are out there and the rest of the teachers in PE are trying to cover. Very difficult. Other issue is, of course, cell phone and cameras, or the cameras on the cell phones. Very difficult now. You guys all know that you know we have TikTok, social media, which plays a vast, I mean, it's important in the lives of our students. At the same time, it's a danger in the lives of our students because quite frankly, they don't have the maturity level um, to be able to make the best decisions when you have, you know, when they turn on their phone inside the locker rooms, things are going to happen. So supervision is extremely important and that is a concern from one of our, from our teachers. Now I get to talk to you guys about Aries data. And I need everybody to kind of follow me on this. Within Aries and the way that we input data in Aries as administrators is when there's a, a we have a tab called uh, assertive discipline where we input all um, documented cases of issues or concerns where a student may have or is uh, disciplined. So we looked at all secondary sites, excluding AFC, um, Fairview, and so Alt-Ed. We excluded them because they do not have locker rooms. And there was, in 2023, 11,478 total entries. That encompasses everything in terms of discipline. 69 of those entries, which were documented with the NARIs by administrators, occurred nearby, outside, uh, going to, walking away from the locker room. That also includes maybe someone went in the locker room, unsupervised, stole a cell phone or stole something, and then they came out. Five cases or five entries were documented as having occurred within the locker room. So those five cases would mean there was an actual fight that occurred inside the locker room. So I want to just share that data. That was 22, 23. Here's 21, 22. You may ask, why is there such a discrepancy between uh, discipline, right? And I'm going to tell you from 21-22 to 22-23, Chico Unified grew. We had more students. Along with more students, sometimes means there's a little bit more adventure, which means that more students are getting in trouble. And therefore, we, you know, you saw the higher number in 23-24 versus, sorry, 22-23 uh, versus 21-22, where there was 8,701 entries. Of those, 72 entries were associated with the locker room. 
and there were five associated or five of them having occurred inside the locker room. Now we have the next, this slide I hope will answer some of uh, our other questions, is what do we do for our students that don't want to change inside the locker room or have difficulty changing in the locker room for whatever reason? And I have to say that as administrators, teachers, and counselors, we work with the student and the parent to find a way to work with them to find a privacy or a place for them to change. That can be a classroom, that could be another bathroom, that can be an office space, or it could just be a bathroom with a stall. We always work with all our students. And this could be a student that says, hey, you know what, I don't feel comfortable, or two, I feel bullied, or three, you know, this isn't my locker room, I don't feel like I belong. Well, this is the options that we create for them. Here's some pictures of Chico High School. This is what their locker room looks like. It's kind of interesting, and, and I say this, as uh, once you've seen one locker room, you kind of seen them all, you'll see why. There's PV, and I'm looking at PV at the right, and I'm like, oh goodness, look at that, that's Chico Junior. That, because that's what the locker room looks like, so you'll see here in a second. Bidwell, Chico Jr., and Marsh. And as you can tell, you have those big, huge aisles. And those big, huge locker rooms that you can't see through. I do want to share one thing that uh, it's not on the presentation. But our teachers are really good because when the sixth graders came over to the junior highs, a lot of our uh, teachers, what they did is they put all the sixth graders in one side or one aisle to keep them all together. That was a request from our parents. We thought it was a fantastic idea and we implemented that. Hey Pedro, can yeah. you go back? Yeah. Because <clears throat> these uh, picture slides are not in our presentation. Um, to the next slide before. Um, the picture on the left and the picture on the right are very different. Yeah, you're right. Wh what's the difference? Boys and girls locker room. Which one's which? If I recall, the one on the left is boys and the one on the right is girls. Uh -huh. Previous picture. You have uh, the boys and girls locker room. Uh, boys on the left, girls on the right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So we have some recommendations from our PE teachers. So the first one is locks. And if you could see there, these are the type of locks that they're hoping to get. As you recall, some of the supervision issue was that our students having to deal with outdated locks and our students having difficulty opening them and or forgetting to lock them. Then they get lost, misplaced, or worse, they get placed on another student's locker, which then creates a security issue. The majority of supervision issues arise from staff not being able to be two places at once. So uh, they would like additional supervision inside the locker room. It's difficult for them. The other thing is every student, they, they really would like to see every student wearing a uniform. And they've also asked that for the school district to provide a uniform, as re and this has been requested from the high schools. All sites have requested, the, they would love to see water bottle filling stations on the blacktops. And at this point, I want to say thank you. And I'm going to invite Carrie McGar and Mr. Uh, Lawrence Taylor up. And at any time, we could also ask our uh, junior high and high school administrators to come on up as well. But I'll let that be come from you. All right, so I think at this time we're opening it up for questions from board members. Yeah. 
He's asking for the administrators at the middle school mm -hmm. to come up as well. Oh, no, no. No, if they're available. Want, if we want them. Yes. Okay. Um, I just wrote down some notes as we were going through the presentation, um, prudently holding my questions till the end. Um, <laughs> why are such a high percentage, 10%, at Chico High failing, in your guys' opinion? The other schools, you can go back to that slide if you like. Uh, it's up there toward maybe a third of the way in. Yeah, there was, there it was, no, one forward. So 10% of Chico High students are getting an F, and um, the next closest one is the total figure, so that's not a good comparison. So PB, 2% are getting an F. So what's your guys' take on that? Um, so I would guess, like, and I can only speak for my own classes personally, is that a large part of it comes from attendance is the most common reason why students are struggling within my mm -hmm. classes is classroom attendance. Um, dressing down becomes kind of a secondary and usually the kids that don't attend school very often, once they do start coming back to school, they're usually the ones that don't dress down as well. And so the combination of those two things are usually the biggest combination for why kids fail from my perspective. So cabinet, um, is there a attendance problem at Chico High relative to PV? No, I would think that they're pretty similar um, on what kids are attending to each school. Um, I would have to look, uh, Tim, I don't know if you off the top of your head would know what their attendance rates were last year. Well, I'm not complaining, okay? I mean, if Chico High wants to fail students for not attending PE or not dressing down, you know, it's okay by me. Um, I am really curious as to why PV is coming up with such a different number. That's a really remarkable difference, 10% versus two. So I was gonna point that out. Um, Can we stay on that topic? Because I have questions sure. about the same thing, thanks. <clears throat> um, so kind of, Rolling with that same question, um, so if we just look at the high schools, um, a D or an F, we're seeing almost 20% at Chico High, um, and a D or an F at PV, we're seeing 6%. That's a really, really big difference. It's a significant big difference, and the only thing that we're hearing right now that's different is the four points, minus four points versus minus three points. I mean, I would love to understand better from any of our PE teachers, like how is PE graded and how does a student fail or even get a D, like how does a grade drop in PE? Um, so that's um, kind of the bigger question. Um, and then <clears throat> from that I can kind of glean why the foster and homeless youth are failing at a higher rate because of the two things you just said, attendance and dressing down. And I would imagine also participation if they're not participating, that's a big portion of why kids aren't um, excelling in the class. If, again, if some of it's attendance, if they're not making up the work that they missed, um, if there was some type of assignment that they needed to do and they didn't make up that, but I would imagine most of that would become with um, participation, that the kids are just not willing to participate. Why they're not participating at a different rate at Chico High versus PV, I couldn't answer that question. And, uh, and again, as this teacher up here, he would be only, only be able to answer to his class. Yeah, and if they're not dressing down, if they're consistently not dressing down, they're, the best that they're gonna have is a 60% at CHS, which is a zero room for error. They need to be getting 100% and everything else. And that's just not the way it works in our world. <laughs> 66 out of I thought 10 it was six out of ten for partic the participation component. Is that correct? Yeah, which is sixty percent, which is zero percent away from failing. It's like you know. That's just a portion of the grade, correct? Right, right, right. So if, if in that category they're in getting sixty percent, they have to get higher than that to to not you know to to keep above that line. Can I? Yeah, of course, you can jump sure, in. So. Um, in my class, uh, daily participation represents 50% of their grade. 25% is based on uh, assessments, uh, whether those are physical, not necessarily can they do something, just can you show me how to do something, and or even like a quiz on 
the actual sport or activity that we are doing. So that's that 25%. And then that other 25% represents that personal and social development that happens, the, the sportsmanship and the, the things that occur with group and team activities. So it's not necessarily the, the, for us it's a seven out of 10, but that only represents that 50% of their grade. And that is true across our site. I don't, I don't know about ours. Sorry, where do you work? I'm oh, sorry. Marsh Junior High. Okay. Three. <laughs> yeah, and so I guess just to round out that part of the series of questions, <clears throat> just regarding grading, how grades are broken down, how the how dressing down may or may not impact a student's ability to pass a class. Um, and I also had a question about the students with disabilities having Ds or Fs at a, a relatively higher rate than some of our other targeted case, targeted groups. So just some orange flags for me. Yeah, go back to that because that, I, I missed that. So, so you're telling me that students with disabilities are also failing PE. So can we give some kind of careful, thoughtful analysis as to why that is? Come yes, uh, I can. There is also a high absenteeism um, within that group. And so anytime that you have a high absenteeism within uh, a certain population of students, uh, of course, uh, uh, the way that it's set up within PE, uh, the students, will, it's very difficult to pass. And I also need to share that um, unlike other uh, subject areas in um, junior highs um, and also in high schools, well, sorry, just junior highs. I won't say high schools just yet. It is a federally mandated class. It's not only a federally mandated class, but they need to have 40 plus minutes of daily physical activity inside that class. And that is the assignment inside of that class. So when that student doesn't do that, which is that assignment, um, I, I will tell you that only having gone through this at Chico Junior th through a federal mandate um, uh, audit, if you will, uh, they looked at that very badly. And they want to see records of all the students and all the minutes that they are doing to ensure that they are getting 40 minutes of daily activity. It's a very, very, um, I guess, intense recording process of making sure that students get physical activity. That's for freshmen too, right? I do not know that answer, whether it uh, happens for freshmen I mean, as well. It's, but it, it's, I guess I'm just inferring from the requirement of uh, only 10, 11, or 12th grade, you can take away those requirements. It sounds like freshmen is required too. Um, you might be more formulated than me right now. So I have a, a question, um, a curiosity. Like, I have a pretty high opinion of all you guys, our staff and administrators. I think that you guys are pretty doing a good job out there. And um, if a student came to you, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I missed your name. Uh, Lawrence Taylor. Great, thank you. Um, and, and said, not like a junior high kid would, would do this, right? I mean, but, but if a kid came to you and said, you know, I'm really having a hard time with this fill in the blank unit because of my such and such disability, you know, I mean, junior high kids really don't talk this way in my, in my experience, no kidding, you know, but, but if one did and could, and there might be that old soul out there who, who would approach you one-on-one -on -one and make, give you a message like this, how would you handle that situation? Uh, just like with any student in any class is that when they approach a teacher with a problem is that the first inclination is to help them with said problem. So long as it's reasonable, I mean, again, kids are going to come up with every excuse in the book for the most part, but if it's a legitimate concern and they're coming to you with a problem, is my first inclination is to try to fix the problem. Um, so I would, if I couldn't fix it myself, then I would approach my administrators, my department chair, things like that, to try to, to um, alleviate the problem. Would you ever go out of your way 
or your colleagues, anyone, feel free to speak up to to notice a kid that was had a disability, maybe a visible one or or one that you were merely aware of, and, and was on the sidelines and and engage. I mean, this is your job, right? To like uh, try to engage a child who's not well, participating and try to maybe put it together that maybe there's a reason why they're not and, and try to fix that problem. If we're talking with a student with an IEP or you know a special ed student, they would have already had a transition meeting or a meeting with the IEP team to see what the accommodations for that student would be when it comes to their disability. So it would be no surprise to them if they had a student with a disability in their class and they would work around the accommodations for those students in that PE class. So I just want to make sure that we are, we are clear on that. That's what it comes to with a student with a disability. So if we're looking at if they're still working within their IEP and their accommodations and a student, let's just say it's a speech student, and their accommodation has to do with speech, and they're not participating, then that's when their grade would fall. If there's something else within their accommodation and they're not with those accommodations and it's still not working within that participation, then that's how their grade would fall. Am I correct? Okay. And we're super lucky, sorry. Uh, we're super lucky in that our our special department does an excellent job of giving us that information before school even starts. So at our very first staff meeting before school, I'm handed all of my kiddos and I can see what are accommodations that have worked. I can see all the exact diagnosis of what they're struggling with and then it's broken down for me. Okay. Um, and then does that translate from school up into the new school? So your new crop of kids, are you hearing from, from like the previous school and then down to high school and all that? Okay. Don't forget to talk into the microphone um, because of the, so the rest of the crowd and um, our folks on, on YouTube can hear. Um, so the millions of people who are watching worldwide, they want to hear what you have to say too. <laughs> the, sorry, the last thing that I was trying to formulate was um, just to clarify that students are not necessarily they're not, they're not going to fail because they are absent. They're failing because they're not making up the time from being absent. And there's an opportunity to make up that time. Since we can't actually fail students for being absent. You're correct. 100% correct. However many days that they may be absent, if it is an excused absence, they get that many days uh, to make up that assignment. And in this case, that many days to make up the PE work out. Yeah, I have a couple questions, but I think probably what I'm hearing is that um, students who may have um, maybe specifically just missing the PE period, correct? Like it's an unexcused PE. They're there maybe for the rest of the day, but they don't show up for that particular period. That does happen. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. That even then, happens at the junior high level. Yesterday. <laughs> and then um, my other uh, question for teachers, I'm definitely hearing um, from the presentation that um, the schools are favorably looking upon uh, um, having the students be in a, a uniform, like a, everybody wears the same one. Um, I'm curious um, just what you consider uh, appropriate what what you would consider appropriate athletic wear. I mean I know what I consider appropriate athletic wear but if a student girl guy whatever shows up in jeans um, as often you might in in winter um, how is that considered okay not okay it does this vary from class to class teacher to teacher school to school what what do you individually consider passing for athletic wear um, so at Chico High, we have a tendency to go with t-shirt of some sort, shorts or sweatpants. They can wear sweatshirts or jackets if it's cold. Um, but big thing is we're looking that they changed out of their school clothes. So if they're wearing their jeans out to PE, it's a pretty safe bet that they're probably not changing out of those into another pair of jeans to go out to do PE. Um, like Mr. Caldera said, is that jeans are getting more and more active-esque, I guess. But we typically, we're not going to allow jeans to cut it as PE uniforms. Um, we don't really care so much about the colors. Um, long as they're changing into something that they can move around in that's safe, that's not going to be revealing. Some, um, some females will come in with stuff that may be a little bit too revealing, that if they start moving around, that we could have some wardrobe type malfunctions, and we have to go have them get something else on. 
So all I see on um, high school campuses and middle school are Crocs. Our kids changing out of their Crocs and do a pair of tennis shoes every single time? Um, no. Um, and that, at Chico High, we, that's, that's a suit cut. That, those are not athletic shoes. They're dangerous in a lot of fashion. They'll, we have a lot of kiddos that will say, oh, but I have them in sport mode. I mean, my, my kid's the same. I have a 10-year-old, and he will go out and run as hard as he can in Crocs. And it can be done, but it's not a safe. If they cut wrong, is that we're trying to cut down on injuries as well with the footwear. So we say no to the Crocs, uh, Birkenstocks, uh, slides, that type of stuff for safety reasons. I do want to clarify something on the Crocs just in case our public is listening. Uh, Crocs is a brand and they have multiple shoe types of shoes that are also called Crocs and some of them are actually used for CrossFit, uh, which are actually used for athletic purposes. So just want to share that just in case our public may not understand. I'm talking about the part. ugly plastic ones. Yeah. Oh, I, I hear you. It's the one my wife won't let me buy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, I know that some students with particular disabilities have um, like midline perception problems which keep them from being able to jump up and down, jump from side to side. Do, do you get a breakdown that gives you that much information so you know that if, for example, you're asking a, a student with a disability to try to hit a birdie in badminton, and the chances of them ever being able to accomplish that are zero. What do you do for adaptive PE? Yeah, we are absolutely aware of all those situations, and I feel super blessed that we have adaptive PE teachers that coordinate with us, so come to our site, meet with us, and our student and families, and they're part of that the IEP team or 504 team, whatever um, the case may be. And uh, we work together to figure out the best way. But I'm pretty certain that I could probably speak to a lot of physical education teachers when we say that we are not grading you on how well you do something. It is mainly about participation and effort. That is what we're looking for. You will never be graded down on <laughs> missing a birdie. <laughs> I also want to add to that that um, I've been lucky to work with a lot of physical education teachers and what they do best and want more than anything of any child or student is for them to be physically active. So therefore adapting the activity to the ability of the student is always first and foremost. Um, how do you respond when a student might come to you and um, just let you know that they really don't have other clothes to change into? Are there always loners on hand? Or um, I, I just am imagining, you know, a kid who might just not have that set of clothes for whatever reason, you know, switching houses or other, other reasons. So yeah, at Chico High, um, in our offices, we have just loner clothes. Like at the end of the year, we'll ask students that are finishing up their PE career to donate uh, lightly used PE clothes. And then we take them to, you, to our laundry facility and we wash them. And then we keep them in our office. And then so if somebody comes in and says, hey, I forgot my shoes or I forgot um, a shirt or whatever, we try to go get them one. Um, if for some reason we don't have a size or something, is that we will go, go to the stock and just grab another one out and then we'll turn it into a loaner to give to them. Um, also, um, a lot of the times we'll have uh, counselors come to us and say, hey, w this person came to us and they need PE clothes. And then we just go have a, we have a grant pro policy and we go get them full sets and, and uh, grant them those. When they come to you for um, loaner clothes, do, um, I should call it temporary clothes, loaner sounds, I don't know, negative, um, borrowed clothes, do, do um, they don't get a suit cut for that, do they? No. Okay. And, um, is there any kind of stigma that you've observed at all about students using the loaner clothes? Sorry, the borrowed clothes? No, because our borrowed clothes look identical to our regular PE uniform. Like, they don't have any designation on them that says, hey, by the way, I borrowed this. It's, no, it's just, um, and we don't have a, a strict policy where if they don't bring them back, 
is we're like, okay, whatever, we go with the, go to the next grouping and just continue on. We're not chasing them down for them afterwards. Um, but yeah, no, there's no, I, I mean, they go into the office, it's very, um, it's accommodating, they're not, nobody's seeing them go to the basket and grab them out of the basket. It's they come in and ask. Now the one thing that could be said is that they have to come in and ask. They have to advocate for themselves if they want to. And there are some kids that might not be willing to do that part of it. Um, maybe we, they, we seem intimidating even though we're very accommodating in our offices. Sorry. I don't always get to be up here, so I'm gonna do a shameful plug for our PE teachers. If you wanna make a PE teacher happy, buy them a laundry detergent. <laughs> and as funny as that sounds, our PE teachers across the district, junior high and high school, they will wash the PE clothes for our students. And they do so routinely to make sure that they have clean clothes, so on and so forth. I was going to add on to that just because when we were meeting with the PE teachers um, and we, uh, we met with them from every site and then we had all the PE teachers meet um, on their district, uh, on their collaboration day that we gave them questions to answer and get bring back. But, but one of the things they're saying is the con they're doing laundry and I appreciate them for washing the laundry um, when kids bring them back and having them available because every site has a washer and dryer for them but our, our PE teachers are now also people that do laundry. I appreciate your effort for that. I'm just gonna add that, like these are our kids and we don't want them to fail. <laughs> we care about them. And so if I have a kiddo who is not wearing their PE clothes, I guarantee you most teachers are gonna be like, what's happening? Talk to me, like what do you need? I even had a kid yesterday and he's like, oh, I forgot my PE clothes at my mom's house but I'm not going there until next week. I'm like, no worries, let me grab you another set. Now you can have two of both houses. Like. I don't think anybody's out there to, to get you when it comes to dressing down. I think we really want what's best for all of our kids and I, I don't think they wanna wear their cute school clothes out to PE and, and I, I think you know they have their tennies that they don't wanna crease. I don't know, do you guys have that in high school? <laughs> so I feel like, I, I think that we all want what's best and if it, we're gonna definitely go out of our way to ask our kids what is going on? How can I help you? How, how can I make this better? What do you need? I, I really think Everybody's going to come from that stance. Thanks. Um, first, just to put this out there, I have a question actually for, um, I think, Julie and Jacqueline. Could we, in the future, get a rough breakdown on what it would cost to implement the requests, uh, recommendations from the PE teachers that we saw on that slide? Uh, yeah, there's locks and extra, extra supervision. Um, just so we know, you know, if in a perfect world, what that would cost us. And secondly, um, I'm still concerned about the grade distribution. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot. And one of the things that I'm really concerned about is that whether our students go to PB or Chico, they're getting the same education or the same level of education. And what this tells me is either really different students go to the two schools and demographics are, are different, or else we're offering programs that at least grade and possibly educate in different ways. So I'd like to, and there's not an easy answer for that, but I'd like to know in the future again, what are the differences there, and how can we bring those two programs into greater alignment? I, I'd like to answer that question. One of the things that we do through district-wide staff development is we ask all our departments what their wishes are. And I can tell you that one of the wishes uh, for a while, not just this year, has been for the PE departments across both sites to be able to get together and discuss some of those uh, grading policies, um, units, and how to get more activity amongst their, their uh, students. So that is something we're working towards. Thank you. Um, I wanna kind of trail on um, Tom's initial uh, request. Um, so this is just an information only item. We're not taking action necessarily tonight, but we can see if it's in, within the capacity of, of staff to, to crunch some numbers or look into something for us. So, um, but the bullet points I made from the requests or concerns from the presentation are an increased need of supervision, um, addressing out of date locks, um, which also kind of goes into that supervision piece because if we're having to re-combo or look up combos, um, that, that's an adult that is taken away from the entire situation. Um, locker floor layout, 
um, which is obviously going to be a long-term fix that's going to cost a lot of money. Um, uh, cell phones and cameras, usage in the locker rooms, like how would, how would that even be addressed or implemented? I know that there's a district um, in the sacramento area that doesn't allow that, but I don't even know how you do that. Like, how do you enforce that? We, that's like we've been hitting our heads for almost two decades now about cell phones <laughs> in schools. Um, district provided uniforms at the high school. Um, so what, is that, what does that, that cost look like? Um, and then the water filling stations on the blacktop, I think is also a great safety concern to, to look into. Um, and I know that we already have some pretty quick, quick, quick numbers on the water bottle filling stations because we have installed those recently. Um, yeah, thank you. I have another question. Um, in regards to uh, when students are accommodated if they choose to uh, dress in an al alternative location rather than the locker rooms, um, it seems like five minutes is a pretty limited time to, um, to meet those students those needs uh, a couple of questions one um, how do you accommodate for students who want to change in a stall where maybe they're waiting for the stall um, or maybe they have to like you mentioned go to a an office or a classroom or, or wherever uh, how like do you allow more time um, in that way and then also oh darn I forgot my second part but it'll come to me, but maybe go ahead and start with that. <laughs> I'll answer your first question, and uh, as you re remember the second one, feel free to let me know. So yes, uh, let me walk you through a little scenario, that way we understand. Say that we have a student uh, that brings it to the attention of an administrator or counselor, say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm having difficulties changing inside a locker room, uh, I don't feel safe, or I'm having issues with another student in there, don't want to go there, whatever the reason, X, Y, or Z, doesn't matter. Uh, we will work with that student. The minute we start working with that student, finding a place for the student to be successful, then we communicate with the teacher. And if they need additional time, we accommodate that. If we need to accommodate them extra time to leave earlier or arrive er, uh, later, so on and so forth, we always adjust time for the student. Within reason, of course, because we also do not want students taking advantage and we have to make sure that they meet the, um, uh, the physical activity minutes uh, that they have to meet. I remembered my second part. Thank you, though. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I guess one of us uh, brought up um, the stigma associated with borrowing uh, a uniform. I'm concerned about the stigma associated with kids who don't feel comfortable in this scenario and um, feeling uncomfortable for having to do something um, different than their peers. 99.9% .9 of the time, no one knows. Because the students will meet on the blacktop or designa designated area. And students will usually work with the teacher and say, okay, hey, where am I going to be next uh, tomorrow? We're going to be on the blacktop. Perfect. And that's where they're at. They're in roll call. The students only know they're in roll call. So. Lastly, and maybe you don't know this, but what percentage um, would you say of kids are, are asking for like an alternative location, a different place to change other than the locker room? And it probably varies from site to site. I would say it does vary from site to site, but I can tell you that we've been doing this for, I'll, I'll just give you my example, and maybe you can uh, extrapolate an idea from there. I was at the Chico Junior for the past 17 years um, as an administrator. I can tell you that we had uh, at least uh, anywhere from a handful of students, uh, maybe dropped down to around two students per year. Um, and for multiple reasons. And then we'd have some students that would say, hey, you know what, uh, trial basis, I don't want to change in the locker room, but then they felt comfortable and they would go into the locker room and start changing. So it's a, it's a process. We work with every, every student and uh, we try to make those accommodations for them so that they are successful. Just for my <clears throat> clarification, um, tardies and PE are counted if they're not on the like on the blacktop in time, right in roll call, right. So, so at the the regular school tardy bell is not the same as the PE tardy notice. Okay, that was just my making sure I'm understanding the full picture. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's a. Uh, I could add to that. Probably go longer. Than, sorry, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I could say the following is that uh, students are very, very savvy and they know that they can change in like two minutes. So some of the favorite classes that they're late getting into the locker room is usually P.E., if that makes sense. The bell rings. They go, man, I can change in two minutes. I don't need to walk there. I, I could run there later. And so they're hanging out with their friends a little later. So it's kind of interesting how that all works out. Um, can I shift gears and bring up a different subject? As long as it's related to the board workshop. Oh, yeah, topic. it's related. Oh, for sure. Um, cameras on cell phones. Um, I think I brought this up in our meeting, but but I don't. We didn't talk a lot about it. But um, does uh, England, the UK? I don't remember if it was one county or, or the whole country, but but last week they banned cell phones in schools, you know? Um, I'm sure somebody somewhere in California has talked to you, Madam Superintendent, about whether this is somehow doable and, you know, what, what, what are the options for maybe doing something like that here? Because I know that just a lot of so, social media and there's just a lot of things going on with cell phones, potentially cheating, artificial intelligence, I think if you asked educators, they would be game on. Let's not have cell phones in schools. I think if you ask parents, that's a very different response. I think our parents really feel that they need that connection with their children, especially um, to and from school, or uh, if they feel that, you know, our society, we've, there have been some situations where they feel unsafe, school students, for example, and they want that direct contact with their students. Well, I'll send the message out there to the world that I, I know a few parents here in town. And um, I'm, I'm open to the idea of, of getting rid of cell phones in school because I think it's diminishing from the educational experience. So just for everyone's information, I, I, I want to take a closer look at that, especially if it's a potential problem or a, a realized problem in, in our, our locker facilities. Um, so yeah, that, that's a very serious concern. Yes? And I think we can look at things um, like at, for a specific class. I think it's going to be very difficult for a student to have their cell phone and be out participating in physical education. So, you know, maybe there are classes where we say you, you don't bring a cell phone or the cell phone stays, that comes into the locker, it stays in the locker, in the locker room. If we see it out, we're going to hold it, which is a whole other set of issues. But. And I want to clarify most of the time, and, and Carrie, if you guys, if you want to chime in, is that Kids have to keep their cell phones in their backpacks and, and put away. Is that true, administrators? That They're not supposed to be having them out any time in classrooms or in locker rooms or PE no. without teacher permission if they're going to be using them in class for something. But the majority of the time, they have to be put away and off, correct? Okay. Um, is there like a, uh, what, what's the circumstance where your cell phone could get, we, this is maybe a, the topic for, I, I realize this could be a whole nother conversation, you know, but, um, you know, I mean, just like you're saying like, hey, put that away. We don't, we don't allow cell phones here in the, in the locker room. Is, is that pretty much as far as it would go? Or it'd be like, oh, that's mine. Give me that right now. I mean, what, what, what where's the discipline scale at? Um, I try to avoid taking cell phones because some of these kids' cell phones are worth a week's pay to me. <laughs> so I, and if anything has, were to happen to it while it was in my possession, is that kind of ends on me. So I don't take them, but I will, if it gets to be a big problem, I will radio a campus supervisor to come get it, and then it goes to an admin to deal with that, and then they have to get it from the admin. I mean, to be clear, all jesting aside, it would not be your problem if you were on the clock with, you know, it would be the problem of the school district. If right. he broke a kid's cell phone, it wouldn't be him paying for it, it would be us paying for it, you know? Um, but we can't have kids uh, bringing cell phones into locker rooms where they might be filming people, right? So that's a serious problem, and we need to have a serious uh, approach to it, I think. Um, we we do have the approach of if I see it is out, then I am taking it and I am turning it into my administration. And um, it was a lot more prevalent earlier in the school year, and now students, uh, it's much less, thankfully. Well, 
thank you for taking that firm hand. And it sounds to me like they got the message and so they're not doing it anymore. I would encourage, uh, I mean, we should be doing stuff like that. And I, I think that would tie back to <clears throat> the probable need for increased super extra adults for supervision too, probably where it maybe it's a little bit more difficult to <clears throat> to monitor all of the happenings. Um, I thought I had something on the tip of my head, but now I don't remember what it is. It's that the things I'm bringing up are so interesting that they, all other topics just kind You're of right, pale in comparison. Oh yeah. Um, does there... I'm kind of going back to what you were saying about um, the, the low number in your experience at Chico Junior, um, the low number of students who really emphasized the desire to have better privacy while they were changing for, for PE. Um, there are, in the locker rooms, there are like bathroom stalls, right? That there they is. can, at Marsh there's four. Girls. Oh, in the girls, there's and four. Then and then three in the boys. It's the same at all three middle schools. There's uh, anywhere from three to four in boys' and girls' locker rooms. Do you think that that, I just am imagining being a middle schooler again and how it, it, it is, I mean, we deal with it and we eventually get used to it. Usually, um, you know, there's always going to be, a, and I hope that it's better today than it was, you know, when I was in school a long time ago. Um, some of the comments, body shaming, sort of teasing that happens that maybe doesn't get reported out as like an assertive discipline thing, but just, you know, kids kind of experience some of those bullying things, which hopefully are mitigated a lot by having an adult present, right? Um, but maybe if there's um, like a, a more, I'm, like, I'm imagining like pop-up changing, you know, like temporary little changing units that people can just slip in and change their clothes out really quick if they wanted a little bit more privacy, but in that locker room space. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Carrie. <laughs> um, I get it. And I, I do, I would like to believe that it is better, uh, but I, we do allow our students to choose where they are in the locker room. Yes, we try to group our sixth graders like in those rows together on the corner, but um, it, it happens all the time. Like, I don't really like where I'm at. I'm uncomfortable because of this situation. No worries. Let's change your locker. So let's go find a spot for you where you can be comfortable around people that you feel good or closer to this area or closer to the restroom because that's where you like to change or I think we're flexible in trying to make sure that everybody feels safe in that environment. I also like to add that our PE teachers are extremely masterful at talking with their kids and making sure that they respect one another. Um, matter of fact, that's usually what they spend the first two weeks of school is working on make sure that they understand procedures, procedures in the locker room, getting in the line, so on and so forth. I'd like to say that they were the original PBIS initiative um, just because of, well, quite frankly, the way that PE ran was usually the way that your school went. So uh, a very, very highly organized group of individuals. Plus five minutes goes by really fast. My, I'm just gonna say it out loud. I think it was inferred that um, it'll be fun to see Chico High's locker room situation be revamped and equalated. Equal, 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 I, I don't know what the word is I'm trying to say. Equalized? Equalized, yeah. Maybe that's the word I was trying for. Yeah. Anyway, any other questions, thoughts, comments, comments for staff? Are you asking what I was talking about? Oh, the girls' locker room is definitely not as nice as the boys' locker room. It looks more outdated and uh, smaller lockers and, yeah. It, it, it is outdated, but as far as on the boys' side, I will take the girls' side lockers well, that's 100 a times. Well, that's a different issue. <laughs> and the, the girls' lockers are bigger. They're all big lockers. Mm. We on the boys' side go with. We have big sports lockers, and then we have all small lockers. Gotcha. I, I thought I saw like some of the little, the little ones and a couple we, of the bigger ones. And we have the bigger ones for athletes, so they're for football pads and things like that. Like they go just to athletes. Right. Nothing else? Yeah. Thank you. Big thank you. I, yeah, I, I just wanted to thank the. Uh, the presentation because I, I thought I knew what goes on in the locker rooms, you know, for 
filling out the who stole my cell phone stuff for all those years of my wallet got stolen, my, you know, but your presentation has really filled in a lot of the blanks and I, I appreciate the work that went into the presentation. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank the teachers for being here tonight and very good thank job, you. Mr. Caldero, on your first workshop. Thank you very much, Mr. Marchant. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So uh, we'll move on to public comment for this item. So 4.1 public comment. Um, I'm just going to start at the top of the list on the, on the page. Um, and just a reminder that for public comment, um, folks are given three minutes to address the board. Um, at the 30 second m left mark, you'll hear a, a tone, um, a bell, and uh, that signifies, you know, your time is nearly up and please wrap up your thoughts and, um, and then uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, and so I will call up Sean Mossman as our first speaker, followed by Dr. Christine Leisner. Good evening. Um, uh, well, here I am just kind of still beating the same drum that I've been beating for um, right out a year now. And it seems like a lot of the discussion this evening skirted around an elephant sitting in the room, and that, of course, is the trans issue in the locker rooms. I understand what the state law is, and I understand what the state of California is doing and how it's positioned itself and how school boards have positioned themselves directly opposed to parents opposed to students, opposed to values, opposed to morality by allowing trans students, by allowing boys in the girls' locker room. Um, we talk, a, I heard a lot of, a lot of comments about, uh, uh, used tonight about different situations which apply to most everything but not to this issue. We take this issue and we turn it on its head and, and nothing else matters. We heard about reasonable accommodation. I'm in the housing industry. I know about reasonable accommodation and reasonable modifications. And I understand what that means. If somebody's got a particular issue, something needs to be addressed, something that needs to be addressed, a, a problem that they have because of a disability or because of a belief or because of any number of reasons, we want to accommodate them because we're caring people. We don't want their life to be hard. We, and we understand we may have to adjust a rule or, or modify something so that they can enjoy their life, so that they can be appropriate. But when it comes to this issue, we throw out the idea of reasonable accommodation. We take somebody with gender confusion and we make the entire student body bear the burden of their problem instead of making a reasonable accommodation for that student. We make, we, we instead, we take that boy, we put him in the girl's locker room and make those girls uncomfortable. We compromise them, we violate their dignity, we violate their modesty, we force them to violate their menu, uh, their, their values. It was just right here that they've got to, uh, one of the terms I heard was that they have to um, um, uh, uh, self-advocate. These kids don't even know what that means, to self-advocate. They just know that for years they've been told that they can't say anything because it's going to create an unsafe situation, that they've got to keep their mouth shut. They can't, they, they, they can't speak out and stand for, stand for themselves because somebody else is going to be made to feel unsafe. And it's, a, and, and, and it's, it's this extreme minority of, 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 of the population that, says, uh, that, are, that, that are so frail, that are so sensitive, that from this podium, over and over and over again last year, from this podium, I heard that they are so sensitive that they're going to go commit suicide if we don't give them access to the naked bodies of our teenage girls. That's ridiculous. Um, we heard, uh, we care about, we, uh, we want what's best for our kids. Yeah, we want what's best for our kids. Not just this, 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 this one. Within reason. We're completely without of reason. We said the, uh, the, uh, the, the accommodation request for changing was between a handful and as many as two. I know for a fact that in my one daughter's one class Let's that there were 10 students requested a job. Uh, Dr. Leisner, followed by Michelle Cooper. 
First, I'd like to start off by thanking the three of you that supported the trans policies in the springtime. Um, that saves lives, and I thank you for that. Um, and I'm here today to express a hope that this wasn't targeting transgender kids, but unfortunately it seems as though it is sometimes, especially for com some community members. Um, I recently saw an article published in the Smithsonian Magazine describing the, the, day, the year that Adolf Hitler came into power and how he took away trans people's rights to dress and express themselves as they wish, to use facilities that they needed to use, etc. And this is the same flavor of fascist playbook that's playing out in our country nationally today. I would like to rem also remind everyone that neither gender nor biological sex is binary. At least one in every 1,500 people are intersex, which means that they're born with sexual and reproductive anatomy that does not fit male or female. This is a conservative estimate. More people, one in every 100, don't match what's typical of male-female anatomy. But let's go with the conservative estimate. So this means that in Chico Unified, there's at least 10 students that are intersex in any given school year. These kids need a place to change in the locker room with the beautiful bodies that they were given at birth. So let's talk about locker rooms. <clears throat> According to the Assembly Bill 1266 and the Department of, of California Department of Education, schools are required to foster an educational environment that's safe and free from discrimination, regardless of sex and gender identity or sexual orientation. It states that students shall access the restroom or locker room that corresponds with their gender identity they have asserted at school. Additionally, and I'm sure other speakers today will make outlandish, non-science-based, and non-factual statements about this issue. First, I just want to say I'm sorry that these individuals haven't been educated enough about the issues related to intersex and transgender students to understand it's common practice to allow people to be their authentic selves. Secondly, the California Department of Education website clearly states that students who desire increased privacy regardless of underlying reasons, we'll get a private changing area. It sounds like we're doing that. And this means that schools are required to allow intersex and trans kids to change in the locker room of their choosing while also providing a private changing space for anyone who is uncomfortable for any reason. Schools cannot, however, require a transgender student to use those alternatives because requiring a transgender student to be singled out by using separate facilities is not only a denial of their equal access, it also may violate the student's right to privacy by disclosing their transgender status or causing others to question why the student is being treated differently. And I just, just want people to leave our, our queer students alone. I really do. Uh, we have Michelle Cooper followed by Arwen Funk. Um, I just want to start by saying that I echo all the sentiments that Mr. Mossman said. I mean, I think the big issue here that was not addressed in this presentation was that we have biological male students changing in girls' locker rooms. And I'm really curious as to why that wasn't part of the presentation and what are we going to do about it. Uh, biological girls should not have to feel uncomfortable in their own locker room and they should not be the ones that have to leave because of that. I question any female here if you would be comfortable taking your clothes off in front of a boy. I mean, I wouldn't want to. I go to the gym. I don't, I don't want to do it at the gym. Um, it's not comfortable because it, you don't want somebody seeing you in that vulnerable position. So I, we need to figure this out. Um, I am concerned about the grading as well. Um, if we have that many disabled students being um, given poor grades, I think that is something that it, we need to go back to the special ed uh, teachers and address their IEPs and figure out what is going on and accommodate those students a little better. Um, I have, I, I understand all the concerns of the PE uh, teachers about the locks, the phones, the supervision, the uniform, the water. I think those are all great points, but I think we need to focus on why students are getting bad grades. And if I'm not willing to, as a, as a teenage girl, dress down, I, I might say to myself, you know what, I'm willing to take the hit on the points because I'm not willing to dress down in that locker room because there's a boy in there. 
So I, I, you know, I think we just need to dig deeper on that a little bit. Um, one last thing I want to touch on was the laundry soap comment, and I really hope we are not expecting our teachers to purchase laundry soap to wash these uniforms. I see the, the amount of money that this district spends on Amazon, and I think we can afford to get them some laundry soap. Thank you. Next is Arwen Funk. Hi, everybody. I've changed my mind a couple times about what I was going to talk about tonight. Um, I've come to most of these meetings for the last year, about once a month, and I have watched Claire and Sean Mossman come up here and ask for help. And there's an ongoing fight about transgender students that's obviously going to go on. I think it's worth mentioning that um, bullies call names throw out their pseudoscience, and that doesn't make them right. The reason you say, oh, well, we're following state law. Well, we all know there's laws that are ridiculous. But it's all about how people feel. They, we want to allow them to be their authentic selves, right? You guys have preached about safety for years now, especially since COVID. Everything is about safety and how kids are feeling. I believe those PE teachers that spoke to us this evening. They really did seem to care. But there has been a young woman in front of you once a month for the last year begging for help. She says she's not comfortable. She feels violated. And you guys couldn't even be bothered to put any of that in the presentation tonight. And nobody talked about it until Sean brought it up. You say you care. I've watched when, she, when Claire came up here and spoke before you, and three of you, every time she does, you put your heads down. You don't even look her in the eye as she begs you for help. All that stuff that was talked about tonight was good and valuable information. It, those are conversations that should be had, but this conversation has to happen too. If you care how kids feel, if they're asking for help, if they feel vulnerable, that's what you say you care about, then you should be listening to her. And let me tell you, it's one thing to give special accommodations, tell her that she can go to another restroom on campus. Well, what happens when it's more? When Sean says he knows for a fact it was 10 girls in that class. I have had parents come talk to me because they've heard me speak at school board meetings, and I know that there is an opposite sex student in almost every locker room in our middle and upper schools in this town. And I'm not saying those kids aren't gender dysphoric. I'm not saying that, they might be. But the problem is that your policies don't allow you to actually find out. So what if you're wrong? This is a problem and you guys need to figure it out. Uh, this is informational only, <clears throat> excuse me, and so no action is needed. Uh, we will go on to item 5.1 under business services. Uh, this is a discussion action item for charter schools measure K projects requests. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, bringing forward from the Measure K Charter Facility Committee meeting that was held last month um, regarding two projects for Forest Ranch Charter School. Um, we are asking for your review and approval for two projects, one of them being a sprinkler system repair, reseeding, and, and also sodding in another area of the campus and a replacement for their in-wall NPR tables for their dining area. Um, you s the amount that they're asking for is $40,000 for the sprinklers and uh, grass field repair and the sod. The grass field is, is very large. And the um, $75,000 for the eight new in-wall NPR tables that need to be retrofit. When the campus was constructed, uh, the tables were built in, 
and those tables are no longer available. So they'll be retrofit tables, um, specialty, uh, specially made for those. So tonight we're bringing those two projects forward with Measure K dollars for Forest Ranch Charter School. Any questions? Julie, have we been able to get those retrofitted tables locally, or is it is it something our maintenance staff is creating? What's um, the company that they come from is called Palmer, and they are a, a nationwide company. Mm -hmm. But the the folks that um, do the ordering and the installation uh, for us, they're out of Reading. Thank you. Any other questions for clarification? All right, seeing none um, and no uh, public comment on this, I will call for a motion. Move to approve. I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion to approve the Measure K request from Forest Ranch Charter School um, from Mr. Tennis and a second from Ms. Robinson. Uh, let's, uh, we'll just, we were unanimous last time, so we can, it, if there's no further discussion, just call for a, a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous, 5-0. Thank uh, you. Approved. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to item 5.2, educational services. We're on 5.2.1, uh, public hearing and discussion action for resolution number 1616-23, Williams textbook sufficiency for the 2023-24 to school year. That'd be me. Every year um, we have to make sure that we are compliant with the Williams Textbook Sufficient, uh, Sufficiency Act. Um, that's required through Ed Code 60119 that requires that each pupil within the Chico Unified School District be provided sufficient textbook and instructional materials aligned to the context st standards and consistent with the cycles and content of the curriculum frameworks in the area of history, social science, mathematics, reading language arts, and science. So every year we ask our principals to ask their departments to make sure that they have all the textbooks and the materials they need for each subject matter. Um, they'll get a form that they have to fill out to say that they're sufficient or not, and if they're not, then we get the textbooks that they need to make sure that every student has what they need to make sure that those are done. And we have um, to let you know that, that everything has been taken care of sufficiently wise and that everybody has the textbooks that is needed. Do we have any, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, board technical questions for clarification? Okay, uh, I will open this for the public hearing. Do we have public comments for this item? Seeing none, I will close the hearing. Uh, do we have any motions associated with this item? Yes. Uh, thank you. I move approval of resolution number 1616-23. Second. All right, we have a motion by Ms. Robinson and a, a second uh, by Ms. Konkin. Um, any further discussion, board? All right, seeing none, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous, 5-0, it passes. Uh, on to uh, 5.3, the board. 5.3.1 is informational. This is a first reading of the revised, updated new board policies. So we brought this item forward last time and it had been inappropriately edited, so we're bringing it back for a first reading. This is Education for English Learners, Board Policy 6174. So at this time, there's no action. It is a first reading. Okay, any questions, board? Seeing no questions uh, and no public comment on this item. I have a question. Oh, okay. um, we were talking about another board policy that's on the next agenda item. Um, I was talking about it with you, right, Mr. Marchand? And um, the references of the code sections that it was relative, relevant to had all, were all struck out in that one. But I noticed that in this one, they're not struck out. 
yeah, when uh, you and I spoke and then when I was um, talking on behalf of the district about the strikeout material, we ended up calling, or uh, Ms. Staley ended up calling the CSBA to get clarification on that. Would you like to? Um, sure, happy to. So uh, thank you for bringing that forward. And we did call the CSBA and in the directions that they sent to us, it said that the references were not to be part of board policy. But what they meant by it not being part of board policy is they aren't actually up in the policy. What their intention was is exactly as they are here, that they're designated below as a reference. So we have now gone back and removed those strikeouts and we will just leave those there. Um, and we did learn that they're in the process of making those references um, active links so that you, that you can click right on them and go straight to ed code or civil code. Great, okay, I like that. Thank so you. thank you for bringing that forward. Yeah. yeah, bring that forward. I gave you bad information originally. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. I have a question. <clears throat> I know that I have a suggestion for a wording change, but I, I need to wait for the second reading to bring that forward, right? Because there's no action tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll do that. It's just one word. Okay. Um, seeing no additional questions from the board and no public comment, this Im is informational only, so we will not be taking action tonight and we will see it on our um, agenda for the next board meeting. Uh, we will move to item 5.3.2. Um, it is a discussion action item, approval of the revised, updated, and or new board policies that we saw last time. Correct. These have all been brought forward last time for a first reading. So uh, now would be the appropriate time if there were changes that the board would like to see made for the board to discuss and if appropriate, vote upon the changes. Uh, I do believe that we have public comment on these items. Do we have any questions for clarification from the board on these? Or um, comments or I guess questions? Yeah, just that we are deleting one board policy and I think we already talked about it, but I just want to get it on the record. What's what's the story with the deletion of five one four one point six? I believe Jen uh, Scala addressed this last time, so I'll try to remember what she said, but uh, that it is being oh, is Jen is she here? Okay, then I won't speak for her. <laughs> She's very careful, careful, capable of speaking for herself. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to. Hi. Um, last board meeting, we talked about deleting this board policy because it talks directly about bringing health services onto our campuses. And at this point in time, that isn't something that we're um, considering. We have the community schools grant that we're working on. So it's not. And looked at looking we're not looking at that at this point but maybe in the future so it's just not something we can feasibly do with bringing nurses and doctors and dentists on campuses that's what this board policy is looking at thank you and Thanks. we tend to not have board policies that we can't feasibly do agree <laughs> <laughs> thank you At this time, it looks like there's no additional questions for clarification, so I will call up our public speaker. Again, three minutes with a 30-second warning at the, um, at the end. And uh, we are um, going to hear from Loretta Torres. I'm Loretta Torres. I have two grandchildren in your school systems. And I was reading over your 5.32 yeah, policy, and I was delighted to read the first paragraph of your board policy concerning parental notification. But as I read through the rest of it, I was disappointed that there was were no further mention specifically especially referring to a counselor's being required to inform parents before any different pronouns were used in your classroom for, dis for sexual dysphoria, dysphoria. Because a counselor who actually was at the root of this Aurora Regino 
lawsuit a couple of months ago wrote 900 words in the ER. And this lawsuit is still being adjudicated and appealed. But she was defending her position on keeping secrets from parents. She used data that I believe is too new to be reliable. There are other studies that seem to show just the opposite about problems sexually dysphoric students have as minors. Children's best interests have always been to involve parents. From the day my children started kindergarten more than 50 years ago, parents were we were preached to that we should be involved for a better educated and better adjusted student. And our children matter to us. So I say that this new age transgender craze that's sweeping our nation needs to be re-evaluated for the school district. It, social engineering should not be in your hands at this time. I believe your best interests and what you do best is teaching your students to read, write, and do math, not, not arithmetic, and, 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 and history. Parents rely on you to keep them informed so they can bring their children to adulthood alive and well-adjusted. Keeping secrets is not the acceptable solution here. Change your policy wording. Change it, I beg you, for the students that are coming up and that will, not, will, will benefit for, from parents being involved. Thank you. All right, seeing no additional public comment, uh, board, do we have a motion regarding this item? I move approval of all the changes. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion, board? Uh, seeing none, uh, all those in favor of uh, approval, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Uh, it's unanimous, 5-0, thank you. Um, next up is item 6.1. Um, this is a board member request to agendize item. <clears throat> uh, the discussion action item to, is, to is a request to agendize a presentation with discussion and possible action about the open status of the high school campuses and the issues that students and the community are experiencing related to open campus policies. Um, and this was submitted by myself. Um, last week and um, I'm just gonna pull this up really quick so um, the full context was attached um, in our fancy form um, this item addresses goal three and four to provide behavioral instruction and supports as a proactive approach to creating a safe positive climate in school culture um, and additionally provide those supports for academic social emotional and behavioral needs of foster youth students uh, my rationale uh, for requesting this item come forward in a future um, board meeting um, is it says so far just this school year there have been numerous reports of off-campus fighting, theft, vandalism, littering, loitering, vaping, smoking, and general poor behavior during school hours observed of Chico Unified students uh, due to open campus policies at the high schools and also school cuts. Um, I believe the board needs to be updated on these issues and potential action, potential action may need to be taken to uh, look further into it and potentially um, move to considering mitigation for um, these uh, disruptions. Um, and then it goes on to talk about our LCAP goals and how this is related to that, but I'm not gonna read that off because everybody else is per perfectly capable of reading also. Um, and so uh, that's, my, that's my request. Um, I'm not asking that we close school campuses or anything like that. I think that it would just be beneficial to 
get an idea of what these reports consist of and, um, and what that might mean for how to address those, those issues. Um, at this time, I'm not gonna um, support agendizing this item. Um, Hold on one second, because I think that so, since this is our first time with our new process, mm -hmm. I think we would need, so this is my motion, um, we would need a second for discussion. We're all second for the purpose of discussion. Okay, Carry you. on, please. Um, at this time, I am not gonna support um, uh, agendizing this item. Uh, I kind of dug in and did my own research on the issue, and I reached out to administration in both Chico High and also PV, and just wanted to get an idea of um, basically uh, what, what kind of activity is happening um, when, when students are leaving campus. And I, I know the, what we're talking about is, is the lunch hour or 40 minutes, and from what I understand, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders are allowed to do that now. Um, as a mom of a 10th grader, I know it's a huge deal for him. It's a big rite of passage, um, and it's a privilege for these students to leave campus. Um, and in talking with administration, it's really not an issue that that maybe is significant enough to address, in my opinion, with a meeting. I also um, found out a lot of the activity that's happening is um, not necessarily by Chico High students in regards to some of the activity near downtown, but more of a um, unschooled, even um, students or 19 year olds who are coming from even outside of Chico and um, creating a lot of issues um, from what I understand. And I know um, just logistically, I, I know that um, talking with the administrators, um, if we were to keep all students on campus during that lunch hour, it would require a lot of adaptations with scheduling. They'd have to break it into um, two chunks of time, which just isn't real feasible with um, the fact that they use that time often for meetings and um, things of that nature. And also, um, in talking with the principal at, at PV, um, Mr. Whitaker, you also made the point of at one, I, I believe they've been doing this for about 15 years, and at one point in time, they realized like, uh, ninth graders, it was something that they would just maturity wise, um, it wasn't something that they could handle and they were seeing a lot of issues with that. So they um, made changes based on that and decided that, you know, it was a privilege that um, was for 10th, 11th and 12th graders. And the way I see it is the kids are for the most part, you know, they're um, doing a great job. They're following the rules. And I think to take away a privilege that they've had without um, them significantly violating the privilege is is unfair. So I, I don't even want to bring it to to talk about. I don't see it as an issue. Um, so the context behind what pushed me to do this, and I have no vendetta against open campus policies. I really don't. I support it. I understand the the all of the positive aspects of it. Um, was that I, I observed more than a few dozen students in one, congregated in one location, um, kind of spread out a little bit in smaller groups, doing all the things that I, li well, no, I shouldn't say all, I did not witness vandalism at the time, um, although that could be arguable for, for where they were. But I, I witnessed these students during the lunch hour, CHS lunch hour, within walking distance, so inferring then that these are CHS students, um, smoking, vaping, smoking marijuana, all of it witnessed firsthand. And it bothered me enough to reach out to district staff and find out, you know, what are some of the reports coming in. And I've heard these reports from other agencies in our community that these things are happening during the school hours. And so I was concerned enough to want to hear more information about it and, and how, how could that even be addressed? How can we, how can we help safeguard especially our most vulnerable kids from being allowed during school hours when we are supposed to be responsible for their health and safety from doing these things, it can, which range from drugs, right? Smoking, um, loitering, littering, the things I listed here, um, 
from doing things during <coughs> school hours that are just not appropriate for kids. Like these things are happening because of the open campus policy. So how are okay are we with that? Uh, or, or just not even digging into it a little bit more to find out if there's any kind of parameter that we can help mitigate those, those actions that our, our students are taking. You just said that you communicated with staff to find out what had been reported, right? And you say that so far, district staff, so far just this school year there have been numerous reports of off-campus fighting, thefts, vandalism, littering, loitering, vaping, smoking, and general poor behavior during school hours. So I wanted to see this same data. So days ago, I communicated with staff. And um, today we got an email telling us, in response to my question, uh, what the reports have been. This was interesting, and I'm, gonna, I'm just cutting off for a second because this is, I know the email because I got the email too, and it was in direct uh, opposition of what I've been told by other district staff. So I'll, I will acknowledge that. Well, um, <clears throat> okay, I mean, I don't know why they would tell you one thing and me something else. So according to the email we received today and according to information I received verbally earlier, Chico High School has had one documented entry in the assertive discipline tab um, uh, regarding something that happened off campus. Um, I was told verbally that PB had maybe two episodes involving potential shoplifting at, at, at Safeway. Um, this email says that PB has had one documented entry, uh, entry of assertive discipline. Um, I think that maybe some of the kids who are involved in some of this kind of activity are students who don't actually really go to school. And so they're just kind of maybe floating around town. So totally unrelated to, to the, any open campus policy. Just bad things happening. You know, take, take Children's Playground, for example. Mm. Sorry, thank you. I thought <laughs> I thought you were trying to yell at me. I'm more used to you guys being yelling at me than than uh, being concerned that you can't hear me. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let me give you a little uh, some some props actually. Um, hey, look, far be it from me, Matt Tennis, to say that you know kids don't leave campus for lunch and smoke pot and, and vape and use foul language and, and 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 behave in ways that they shouldn't. Okay, I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna deny that. I, whether the, the, the office, you know, thinks so or not. I mean, yeah, I mean, in a way though, you're just kind of describing humanity, Yeah. right? I mean, I don't people go off and smoke weed and, and, and do hours. things they shouldn't do and be obnoxious and or stuff like that? Or on campus I mean, for that matter. You know, but, but, but the idea that we pin the blame for bad things that happen around town involving people who are Chico Unified students or people who maybe even kind of aren't, um, the idea that we would put the blame on that you know, on the open campus policy, and then the things that, that Ms. Conkin brought up, just the impracticalities of making a change to the open campus policy. I think that your point that I think is, re is really well taken, at least for my part, is that, yeah, we should be vigilant to monitor the behavior of our students when they're off campus and, you know, respond to complaints from the community, you know, as best we can, is what I think we should do, and probably leave it at that. If there's no record of wrongs, how can we, you know, be more proactive than, than just being responsive when they do come along? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that the sort of discipline list is not a comprehensive list of things that are happening off campus. So, if I may, mm -hmm. um, it seems like several board members have had conversations about safety issues with the staff. And I think one of the upsides of agendizing this is that we can get all this information to the public where all of us can hear it and the public can hear it as well and make a better, more well-rounded decision about this. Um, I will uh, echo what Ms. Dalby said. This is, I have no interest whatsoever in um, closing our campuses. I agree with you as well, Ms. Conkin. It's not feasible. Um, it's not really on the table. So the way this agenda item was presented um, is a little sticky maybe, but that said, um, we probably ought to hear about what's going on. We've already had 
a big discussion about, right? It's, it's worth having an actual complete discussion about with prepared remarks and data from staff so we can get to the bottom of why there are disparities between what different people are hearing. Um, Would it be like more appropriate rather to have it be um, within the context of the open status of high school rather like discussing behavior that's happening like, Lunchtime Off safety. I, mean, I don't care what we I call it. I mean, kids before, so. kids do things before school. Kids do things after school. It's not just a matter of the lunch hour. I mean, or if we're going to take the concern to the, you know, like we're we're concerned about what they're doing when they're not under our watch. Yeah, I mean, before again, school, it after really school. What this is called, but if we wanted to call it, you know, a discussion about student behavior in the community when they're officially under Chief Unified Auspices, we could call it that and it wouldn't make a difference. I think it's still a conversation worth having. And I think the amount of discussion we've had up here makes it pretty clear that it is a discussion worth having completely. My um, interest would be to add in, if we do anything to close campus, which is the only way to really get a handle, how do we feed them? We don't have the cafeteria capacity mm -hmm to keep the kids on campus. Yeah, I think that where this is coming from is that <clears throat> it's an issue that I, I think warrants more information and a little bit more open discussion given all the information that we can get. Um, that's just where I came from with this. I'm not, I have no desire, I'm not like trying to forge forward with closing down our campuses because I think that's gonna solve all our problems. I just really wanted to get a better handle on what's what's going on and how, how what could we do to help mitigate it. Um, if I may, one, just kind of, I, there's, so, I'm, there's a little bit of irony here. I feel like um, I, I'm, I'm seen by a lot of people and, and uh, frankly by myself as kind of like a parent, you know, advocate maybe. And isn't it parents who are normally like wringing their hands over those naughty kids, you know, and needing to rein that behavior in and, and stuff like that. But I, I just don't feel that way in this situation because um, it's kind of like you're looking at humanity, you know. I mean, these, these, these are just human beings going off and, and acting inappropriately. They're bad citizens. Um, I think that we teach citizenship to uh, a meaningful degree in the public school system when we, you know, uh, salute the flag and so forth and we enforce rules. You know, there's ways that you're not allowed to behave on campus. I think that, that we do a, I, I, I guess I think we do a respectable job on, on that. To go off on a, on a basically what kind of amounts to a, a kind of a hand-wringing, you know, nanny government witch hunt of how kids are behaving on during, during lunchtime, it just seems like a road that will lead nowhere to me. That's all I'll say. Um, and for clarification, I suspect that we all up here consider ourselves parents. Is that reasonable to assume? Thank you so much. And I'm gonna just jump in here for a moment and say we're really talking apples and oranges. We have the solid data that gets reported in our area system for students that are caught doing something and disciplinary action is taken. There are many, many more reports that come in about students behaving in a way, whether it's verified or not, where we get complaints from our community that students are hanging out in an area, students are doing drugs. I was sitting in a meeting just this last week when the Chico High principal got called to go down to Children's Park because there was an incident happening. Um, and when he gets there, finds out it's not to go high students. So we, we hear lots of things from our community, but then being able to prove that those are students and that discipline is taken, it's just two different, two different things. So I think there are definitely reports, there are perceptions um, that our community has, and, and we all see that. Um, and then there's the actual difficulty um, in verifying and proving that it is a Chico Unified student and that action is then taken. And like, is it worth your guys' time and our administrators staff's time to, to, to track, track that down and, and only to learn that it's not even one of our, one of our students? Is that why, you, is, that, is that really in keeping with your mission? You know, or, or 
I'm asking a rhetorical question, I know the answer. No, it's not. You know, your mission is a whole big long list of other things that, that we are asking you know, our staff to do. Um, so. Well, I would like our students to always represent us in a positive manner when they're out in our community, but you're right. I mean, that doesn't always happen and that is humanity, um, but it doesn't mean we're not gonna keep trying. Um, we do have one public comment, um, so I'd like to jump to that <clears throat> um, before we wrap up our discussion and, and uh, vote. So um, we have Arwen Funk signed up for this item. Thank you. Well, it sounds like maybe the Coalition for Reason is, is alive and kicking at the moment. I, I confess I read this, uh, this agenda item and I found it really confusing. I thought an educator's first instinct is not to educate, but went straight to like an authoritarian lockdown of school campuses. That is so odd to me. And I don't think there's a parent in this audience that believes that you wouldn't do that. So we've, I just don't. Um, I'm old enough to remember during the pandemic when parents were shamed and berated for asking schools to reopen and we were accused of treating school like daycare and now you literally want to create a daycare for teenagers on these campuses. There's, um, it sounds like you guys might be heading this direction anyway, but there's a whole world of curriculum out there to coax better behavior out of juveniles. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe you could even get creative, make it a competition, right? The most kids who get back onto campus by X time make the schools compete with each other. I don't know, but um, I don't think I need to say a whole lot more. I think if you are gonna have a discussion about this, which is probably warranted, I think we would agree that if there are kids out there in the community behaving badly, there's some rationale for having that conversation and creating some kind of an incentive structure for them to behave better. But I think that this particular proposal that went straight to shut down campus probably went about 10 steps too far. Let's talk about education first. I just wanna clarify that in nowhere my proposal, it was confusing and it was my first time filling out this form with a real topic, so it was an exercise for me, but I never mentioned closing campuses. I did say mitigate, which could mean a lot of things. So, um, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm asking for us to just take a closer look at the topic. Um, with that, I feel like we've discussed this way more than we probably needed to, um, given that we have spotty information um, provided at this time which is why I requested to agendize it. Um, so I'm gonna call for the, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, ask one more time. Are we ready to vote? I'm just gonna call for a vote because that's a whole nother vote. Um, all right, we'll do a voice vote on this one. You ready or do you have another comment question? Okay, um, I'll start because that's obvious. Um, I, I say I for agendizing this item. Um, actually, let's, ro let's roll back. Do we wanna reword it at all or can we just, we know what we want to get out of this item. Staff is nodding at me. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay. are we good? Everybody's fine? Mr. Orlando? Well, I mean, uh, Ms. Conklin, would you feel more comfortable with what, if it was worded differently? I absolutely don't like the fact that the open status of the high school campus is even in there. I mean, is it, I mean, do we want to agenda, agenda, put on the agenda talking about issues that are happening with our, our students in the community? During school hours. <coughs> or during what, what Tom said. No, I mean, I think during school hours is fine, yeah. Starting so, at I guess, eight, oh, whatever, when they start school versus. That's too specific. But I guess can I make a friendly amendment then? Um, uh, Mr. Shepard's giving me a funny oh. face. Well, not necessarily a face, just ed code. <laughs> um, if we're gonna agendize something that includes student discipline, just ed code relates to students, the, the, their first step off their, camp, off their uh, property to school, they're ours. And that, that's in force until they get home. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just when, you know, 801 or, or 331, so just wanna keep that in mind. Right. So I guess, 
I'd like to offer an amendment, potentially friendly, uh, that we change the title to a discussion about safety and behavior of students during the time when their behavior is a responsibility of the school district or something like that. I want to I want to consider it friendly. My concern is capturing that before and after school time too because I feel like we have so much less control over that. It, yeah, it, it, it is still it is still our responsibility. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, so. it is still our responsibility. Um, yeah, I would consider that friendly. Okay. Any further discussion on agendizing this for a future meeting? Okay, uh, Dolby, aye. Which way are you? No, going? you go. We're, uh, we always go counterclockwise. Okay. Robinson, no. Concord, no. Lando, aye. Tennis, nay. All right, it fails. Uh, with that, we will go to closed session. Thanks, everybody.